six months later, Napoleon was still deep in Europe, preparing for war again. Among the established sovereigns, he said, war aims never go beyond possession of a province or a fortress. With me, the stake is always my existence and that of the whole empire. Conquest alone made me what I am. Conquest alone can keep me there. Alarmed by France's growing power, now the Prussians challenged him. Napoleon made short work of them. The idea that Prussia could take the field against me by herself, he said, seems so ridiculous that it does not merit discussion. In less than three weeks, he brought the Prussians to their knees, taking 140,000 prisoners, leaving 25,000 dead or wounded. The might of the Prussian army had been entirely crushed. Napoleon marched triumphantly through Berlin to the strains of the Marseillaise, invoking the revolution, equality, and the abolition of privilege. Now master of most of Western Europe, he swept away feudal laws and forced the nations he had conquered to accept the new ones he had created for France, the civil code. But he did not govern in the name of liberty. I have come to realize, he said, that men are not born to be free. Liberty is a need felt by a small class of people whom nature has endowed with nobler minds than the mass of men. He reigned like kings of old, with 44 different palaces, including Fontainebleau. He believed his own glory, the glory of France, and the spirit of the revolution were all one and the same. Like a good Corsican family man, he made his brothers and sisters royalty. Louis became king of Holland, Joseph, king of Naples, Jerome, king of Westphalia. I need my family to stabilize my dynasty, he said. If I distributed thrones according to merit, I should have made different choices. He made Sister Caroline a queen, Pauline a princess, Elisa a duchess. To his mother, he awarded the title Madame Mère. Napoleon always had a lot of respect for his mother. He always remained his mother's child, even when emperor. She was amazed by the success of her son. And she was afraid it wouldn't last. She was supposed to have often said, in her thick Corsican accent, just as long as it lasts. As 1806 drew to a close, Napoleon was still at war. Austria and Prussia had both surrendered. But the Russians, bloodied after Austerlitz, and Great Britain, all powerful on the seas, remained dangerous enemies. Against Britain, he made economic warfare, a continental blockade forbidding the European nations to trade with the British Isles. To defeat Russia, he marched his soldiers deep into Poland. Napoleon's justification is you have to take the war to your adversaries and you have to defeat them, whatever it takes. So going uh, out uh, to the, the, the far reaches of Poland, if that's what it takes to, to, to get the Russians uh, to capitulate, that's what he's going to do. Napoleon was in Warsaw when he was stunned by the news of a surprise Russian attack. He struck back at once, first at Eilau, just 130 miles from the Russian border. Then, later, in nearby Friedland.
the carnage in both battles was terrible. 70,000 French and Russian soldiers killed or wounded. It is not combat anymore, a Russian general wrote the Tsar. It is butchery. Napoleon's army was torn and bloody. The Tsar's army was in ruins. Alexander puzzled over what to do next. When Alexander I was thinking about what to do after the Battle of Friedland, his brother Constantine said, Sire, if you were considering fighting the French, you might as well give each soldier a gun and let him put a bullet in his head. The result will be the same. On June 25, 1807, Alexander traveled to Tilsit on the western border of the Russian Empire to discuss peace with the Emperor of France. To signify their equal status, they met on a raft moored precisely in the center of the Neman River, the boundary between Russia and Europe. When the Tsar met Napoleon, he had one goal in mind, to find a peaceful solution that would benefit him. And the first thing he said to Napoleon in French was, Sir, I hate the English as much as you do. And Napoleon said, then we have made peace. Napoleon's peace terms were generous. He demanded no Russian territory at all. In return, the Tsar agreed to become France's ally, to join the continental blockade and refuse to trade with Britain. Napoleon wanted to have this alliance very much, and he was prepared to sacrifice for it. The alliance of Russia and France, two great empires, would force the British to make peace. Finally, there would be peace in Europe. Only 10 days before, they had been bleeding each other dry. Now the two old enemies were acting like old friends. The Tsar and Napoleon spent long hours together, inspecting each other's armies, awarding medals to soldiers on both sides. After two weeks, the two men seemed to have grown genuinely fond of one another. Napoleon was charmed by Alexander, describing him as especially handsome, like a hero with all the graces of an amiable Parisian. The Tsar, in turn, seemed in awe of Napoleon and his sheer power. As they said goodbye, Napoleon was convinced he had turned the Tsar into a friend and ally. If Alexander were a woman, he wrote Josephine, I would make him my mistress. This was Napoleon's biggest mistake. He thought he actually did charm Alexander. What Napoleon didn't understand was that Alexander would never stick to their agreement. But for Napoleon, the Tilsit peace seemed to be his finest moment for him and for his empire. He came back to Paris in July 1807 to a huge celebration. France rejoiced at the signing of the treaty between the two giant powers. Once again, peace in Europe seemed secure. In 1807, Napoleon's empire stretched from the Atlantic coast to the steppes of Russia, from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. He ruled over 70 million people, French, Italians, Dutch, Germans, Poles. There had been no greater empire since the days of Rome. Flushed with the pride of power, he dreamed of uniting all of Europe under French rule. 
the defeat of Russia and Prussia was so spectacular. Napoleon was stunned by the success. He never, he never visualized such success. And he began to think, my God, I can do anything. His rising star had reached its zenith. Yes, Mola. At that moment, he begins to believe that he is infallible. A superman. Someone protected by destiny. His famous star. He has complete power in Europe. And his pride is very great. Because this is a former little artillery lieutenant who has made it to the top. Ambition is never content, Napoleon once wrote, even on the summit of greatness. 38 years old, intoxicated with power, the ruler of almost all of Europe, he was bent on one more conquest. It was to be a fatal mistake.